I thank the organizers for this opportunity to share the work that we are doing and some of the thoughts that we've had over the last uh, really 15 years. Often it's easy to forget that the work that we do and produce as physical entities are just part of the things that we do. Actually what we produce is thoughts. So I'd like to share with you the thinking process throughout the um, experiments that I've done as well as beyond that I've been uh, building over the years. Okay? So what I'm going to talk to you today about is how life preserves form and function meaning how do living things kind of look like each other from one generation to the other, to the next. So what I mean is, why do we all look like humans? Not why do we look like our immediate relatives? Why do we all look like humans? So for that, we have to start thinking about heredity. And people have been thinking about heredity for a long time, and we've had pretty absurd ideas. As caricatured here, uh, there is the father and there is the son. Uh, you can be sure the peg leg is not transferred. So that idea is clearly not correct. But what are the key aspects that we need to think about and what are the questions we need to answer? Well, I would talk about two questions today and they're at provisional answers. The first one is we have to think about what can be passed on from one generation to the next. And the second question is how is that passed on from one generation to the next? If we understood the answer to these questions, we ought to be able to make anything we want and have it copy itself, okay? But I will uh, mention to you right away that we are far from knowing the answer to both these questions accurately to the level of single molecule. All right, so if we are gonna think about information that's passed from one generation to the next, the first thing we have to think about is what is the minimal space in which you could put that information? So as most of you are aware, we are born with gametes, a sperm and an egg that fuse together upon fertilization, giving you a single cell called a zygote. Then we go through elaborate development and behavior, and in the next generation, the same cycle ensues. And this is common in many different organisms and has led to this sort of realization before that a Hen is only an egg's way of making another egg, which means the minimal space in which you have to put all the information for going from one generation to the next is a single cell. And this is true whether you're an animal, plant, any kind of organism. If you could cut plants and grow a second plant, that wouldn't come up from less than a cell. You would need one cell, okay? So that's the first key concept I want you to think about. And often people are, have heard this term cell a lot, but they haven't really appreciated just how complex a cell is. And that's because if you open many textbooks, you'll see some parts of the cell labeled easy for you to identify, and there are a few techniques that allow you to see everything in a cell, okay? So this is, for you to appreciate just how complex a cell can be, it's a tomogram of a cell, and uh, it's an insulin secreting cell. All these blue dots are little packets of insulin that would be secreted, the vesicles. And once they fade away, you'll see as you go in, there will be green mitochondria, which are like powerhouses of a cell that make energy molecules, other vesicles, this large gap is a nucleus. And this is just at a low resolution. But if you really zoom in and look at a higher resolution picture, it's chock full of stuff, okay? So that's the complexity that biology is dealing with. It's incredibly complex. So if you did a cutaway of that and looked at it, this is how a cell would look with different colored uh, lettering representing the different things that are here, like ribosomes that make proteins and so on. And this does not even include any of the ions, none of the small metabolites, ATP, whatever you want, no RNA, no DNA, none of that is labeled here. So it's exceedingly complex and that is the minimal space in which hereditary molecules have to be present, okay? So in that cell, with all this complexity, how do we think about all the molecules that are accumulating in the cell? How does that happen? Well, we know within the cell there is the genome sequence or the DNA sequence, which is present in pretty much all the free living cells that we know. And from that, schematized here as say four genes, if you will, 
you have transcription that produces RNA, and that RNA may go off somewhere, and it could make proteins, and those proteins could convert some substrate into some product, leaving a sort of cloud footprint inside a cell, okay? But if you think about this process, every single step in that process happened under the guidance of other molecules that were already there, okay? So if you just had this sequence of DNA inside a bag, you'll get nothing. The DNA will be inert just sitting in the bag. So what you need is all the other things that were already there. So in this way, each gene you can imagine is associated with the cloud of molecules that are present inside the cell. Now what that means is you will get the phenotype at any one time, meaning how a cell looks, what are the shape it takes, et cetera, based on the genotype and the phenotype at a previous time, which means if you wanted to figure out why does the cell look this way, just figuring out its genotype gives you nothing. Okay? You cannot derive the phenotype from the genotype of any cell. So I want to illustrate that using uh, this idea from motion capture. So this is Benedict Cumberbatch getting ready to give his best smog. And on his face, you can see these white dots, okay? And when he speaks, I hear your breath. Okay, so all those dots moved, but then what those dots are mapped to depends on the movie. This is The Hobbit, so it's mapped to a dragon. And then as he moves, I hear your breath. Smog moves, all right? So it's like the genotype's relationship to the phenotype or the form is only seen in these changes. So if you, sorry, if you wanted to derive the form, you simply cannot. You would need to um, understand what was the form before. Was it mapped to a dragon? This could have been a completely different movie, like Planet of the Apes or something then there would be an ape over here and the actor would move in the same way and the ape would move. So the point is just knowing these dots, the genome, the inert genome, doesn't give you any clue about what the map is. And the most obvious example of that is all the different cell types in our body have the exact same genome, but they all have different forms, okay? So if you found out just the genome sequence, you couldn't tell the form or function of the cell. All right, so that said, now we can think, what is the information that's going from one generation to the next? We'll start with the familiar one, that is a replicating store, which is the genome sequence. At every cell division, you have that genome sequence replicated, and that gets passed on from parent to child to grandchild. But what about the rest of it that's in the cell? The rest of it that's in the cell is also getting passed on in a particular way, but it's often not obviously seen because that information is cycling by transferring the inf information from one set of molecules to another such that they don't have to be recreated at every cell cycle, but they have to be recreated at the end of every generation. So I'll illustrate something like this with a phosphotransfer, so let's say that's a protein that's phosphorylated by this other protein. Over development, that phosphate might move somewhere, and by the time you start the next generation, it could come back. So this way of transferring information, uh, I define as cycling stores of information. So collectively then, you end up getting the same uh, configuration at a bottleneck stage so that together, they give you a cell level organization, a cell level code or a cell code that is preserved across generations. Now what the cell code really encodes for is the rules for developing the form and function in each generation, okay? That's why we all look like humans, okay? So that said, I think cycling stores are particularly difficult for people to wrap their mind around, so I'd like to give you an experiment you can do in your own minds. You don't need a lab for this. Please play along with me. Imagine if there is water in a container, and we'll start that as one particular generation, okay? Imagine a water container in your minds. Freeze the water in the container, okay? Break the container, leaving the block of ice intact, 
Now pour plastic around it, forming the container again. Melt the ice, and now you have water in the container, next generation. So in your minds, you went from one generation of shape and form to the next, right? The real question is, where is the information for the shape of the container? Each of you made it up in your minds, okay? So that's what's missing when you are not thinking about cycling stores of information. This is an example of that, okay? All right, so that means then the key problem is how do you take one particular form at one generation and transmit it to the next generation? And people have thought about this in a related field of communications where you can think of some sort of encoded signal that is sent along a communication channel, like a TV signal or a radio signal, and then that is received somewhere else and decoded and played out. There could be noise in between, and this general way of thinking about communication across time or across space was really developed by Claude Shannon, who had this beautiful quote in his uh, foundational paper. By analogy with that signal then, you can think about a cell code in one generation being transmitted across interdependent communication channels to the next generation. As I told you, you can't just think about the genome sequence going across. There are other channels of communication that would go across. So, and you can have disruption in the form of mutations that we may be exposed to or shuffling of DNA during meiosis. You could have influence from the somatic cells or the environment. And by analogy, now finally, we can define the problem of heredity correctly. So the problem is, the fundamental problem of heredity is, of, is that of reproducing at one bottleneck stage, either exactly or approximately a cell code selected at an earlier bottleneck stage. It's an exact parallel to how you think about communication transfer. So having defined the problem, I'm going to talk about advances we've made in understanding how it works using my favorite organism, uh, C. elegans. It's a millimeter long nematode worm that you're seeing here crawling across. It has many virtues that make it really a fantastic system to understand heredity. First of all, you'll see it's somewhat transparent. You can look through and see its embryos in there. And uh, what makes it particularly amazing is that its germline uh, is a syncytium that makes oocytes in assembly line from both sides that will fertilize and then give you embryos that are laid in just three days. You can go from one generation to the next. So that last point is what makes it really powerful for asking questions that go from one generation to the next. Not only that, once fertilization has happened, in about 14 minutes, you have an impermeable membrane that forms around the embryo such that you have the paternal nucleus, maternal nucleus, and then you need nothing from the mother. In fact, you can add bleach and completely dissolve the mother, and a C. elegans will be inevitable out of this. The eggs will come in, you'll, uh, you'll have a fusion of the two nuclei, and then they'll proceed to give you all these divisions. For a while, it looks like not much is happening. And then, all of a sudden, they'll start taking some sort of shape. You can see that pinching from either side. It'll elongate, and off it goes. It'll start looking like a worm, and it'll hatch out. So the point I want to make is, in 14 minutes, a worm is inevitable if you just put it at the right temperature. This is much simpler than the situation in humans where you have gestation, placental communication, et cetera. So if you're studying heredity there, it's a lot harder. And this is further illustrated by this sort of lineage diagram that I'll come to again, where you start with this one cell, which then divides to give you all these somatic cell precursors, which will go on to make all your body cells or somatic cells. And the germline, which will give the next generations oocyte and sperm are, is set aside really early, which is also similar in many uh, animal systems, including us, okay? But the really amazing result that made the system tractable 
is the ability to go in and change one gene at a time and what happens to one gene at a time across generations. And this happened because of the discovery of a process called RNA interference, whereby you can inject double-stranded RNA. RNA is usually single-stranded in textbooks. That's what you may have heard of. If you made it double-stranded like DNA and injected it into the animal, you can get silencing of the matching sequence throughout the animal and in progeny, which means something from the outside is somehow getting to the next generation. So we uh, finally labeled this RNA fluorescently, and we were able to show for the first time where the RNA goes once you inject it. So here is a worm's part sort of sh uh, shown here as oocytes and the syncytial germline, which will keep coming up. We injected here double-stranded RNA that is fluorescently labeled. And then you'll see a movie in which you can appreciate where all these magenta gets collected. First of all, you'll see it's outlining all the structures you see there because that's the extracellular space. And then when you watch where it goes, you see that it's collecting mostly in these oocytes. So when we injected, we saw to our shock that whatever we injected was directly going to the next generation. This really highlights a particular point. There are a lot of theories we can make up about living things before we know what the living thing is. So you want to begin first by describing what it is and then make up theories. Because when RNA interference was first discovered and there was this idea of RNA going from one generation to the next, people thought there must be amplification mechanisms all sorts of hypotheses were put forth. And it took almost 18 years to just label and show what you injected went to the next generation. And the explanation is trivial. But this isn't the complete explanation. Because we also showed that if you had double-stranded RNA expressed only in the neurons, you can get transport of RNA from there to the germline, get silencing there, take away the double-stranded RNA source, and you still have silencing that lasts for more than 25 generations. Okay. And through the effort of many, many labs, we now know a molecular pathway through which this happens. We know that double-stranded RNA from the outside enters cells through a transporter protein called SID1. Then it gets cut up into smaller pieces of RNA. And a class of proteins called argonaut proteins, which is conserved across evolution, um, binds to one of these small RNAs, finds mRNAs of matching sequence at these regions called mutator foci that are located just outside nuclei, where you get amplification of more small RNAs because of RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, which can then bind additional argonauts that can cause downstream histone modifications. So this pathway was worked out before we knew that RNA could go from neurons to the germline and before we knew that the injected RNA goes to the next generation. So now we can ask, given the system of RNA going from neurons to the germline and then causing silencing that lasts for a long time, how do all these genes fit in? Does it make any sense? So we tested that for in two steps, one asking what is required for starting the whole process or initiation, and two asking what is required to maintain the silencing. So here, there are wild-type animals and animals where you don't have SID1, don't have RD1, don't have mute foci proteins, or don't have HRD1. If you look at it in wild-type, you get complete silencing of double-stranded RNA coming in and causing silencing in the germline. SID1, RD1, mute, HRD, they are all required. But if you look at maintenance, now SID1 is not required. And downstream factors, these mutator foci and HRD1 are required. So it's as though you started off the silencing by letting in some double-stranded RNA, and then you have an amplification system that just keeps it going. Okay. So there are some implications of this result, which uh, kind of alter your standard textbook models for how animals are made. If you open up a textbook, this is the typical uh, model that you'll see for how body cells are made and how germ cells are made. You have a continuous germ lineage from which you have other blastomeres that will go on to make neurons, muscle, skin, etc. It's only the germ cells that go from one generation to the next. This is all based on an early book by George Simpson in the 50s, uh, 
And in that book, it's presented as in contrast to an idea that Darwin had, where he thought, well, how you make the next generation, the next generation's form, is by sending little packets from the current generation's form. So a nose sends a noselet, and a ear sends an earlet, and so on. And they all collect together, and the next generation, you get your nose and ear and everything back, okay? So this is, of course, wrong. But what our results are showing is you can actually augment the information that is in that cell and change things for subsequent generations by literally sending a packet of information from your somatic cells, okay? So that brings up how to think, uh, the question of how to think about what really is a unit of heredity that's going from one generation to the next. And this has been uh, in people's minds for a long time. And in fact, if you read the popular press or open any uh, textbook, they'll say it's your genome. And that kind of molecular explanation of thinking it's just the genome really stems from a logical mistake that I hope to illuminate now. As many of you may have heard, the experiments uh, that led to thinking about there are units of heredity that go from one generation to the next came from Gregor Mendel working on peas. And in that early paper, he defined that unit as something called cell elements. So he knew there were cells, so there must be something inside cells. Let's call it a cell element. He did not know anything about molecules. And then there was Hugo de Vries, who called it pangene because the pangenesis model by Darwin was in vogue at that time. It's, of course, wrong. And then we had Willem Johansson, who called it the gene. Most of you have heard of what a gene is. But at this time, no one knew what a gene was. It was not molecularly defined. It was just a concept. And then we got the ability to mutate something, to change something in that gene by exposing it to x-rays, gamma rays, et cetera, so what we knew is some unknown part of that gene must be changed, and that's why you now have a different sequence, right? A, a different outcome. And then geneticists localized that changed part to a gene sequence, and here comes the logical mistake. People started thinking the part we can change is all there is. So the gene sequence is the unit of heredity. So it's a pretty simple logical mistake when you think about it with the benefit of hindsight. So how are we to now rectify this and think about biology properly again? I think we should go back to cell elements and try to understand how all the cell elements come together to give you the cell code that's transmitted from one generation to the next. So if we must think about genes, we should at least see two things clearly. One gene sequence, which is transmitted as part of the genome, and that's simply by re replicating. The other is gene regulators, which are transmitted as part of the arrangement of molecules that is a cycling store, okay? So I'll illustrate it here, here from a single gene's point of view. So if this is a single gene that is interacting with all these other complexes, generation after generation, it's coming back to a similar form, making sure humans give race to humans and monkeys give race to monkeys, C. elegans give race to C. elegans, and so on. But there could be other things that are just varying over time that we don't know, illustrated by these stars. So there's much we need to figure out here, uh, which will require concerted effort from many different systems. So we can then finally phrase in molecular terms, what is the question? How is all the regulation of a gene encoded and transmitted? Okay, so that's the question we're going to answer. And when you think about gene regulation, a very common uh, illustration that is put up is this um, diagram called Waddington's Epigenetic Landscape. So I hope I will convince you at the end that this is a terrible diagram. Because one, it gives you an illusion that you're starting at some high point in the hill and inevitably rolling down. And what it's actually hiding is that in biology down one of these rivulets, you're reaching an oocyte or a sperm, which just has to fuse and you're back to the top. So actually, biology looks like this. It does not look like one inevitable downhill uh, flow. So I propose that a better analogy is M.C. Escher's painting called Ascending and Descending. So if you follow these guys who are walking around here, that's going to hurt your brain a little bit. Looks like they're all going up or they're all going down. 
And that's sort of what's happening in biology along the germ lineage. You're getting the same form going from one generation to the next. So an appropriate metaphor for heredity and development is really these ascending and descending stairs. Okay? So armed with this, there's a complicated process that's happening from one generation to the next. How do you study that? How do you figure out? How do you decode the cell code, if you will? Well, we've been in this situation before. Before we knew the genetic code of how you go from RNA to protein, we knew that there are many different RNA sequences that give you many different protein sequences, but we didn't know what the logic was there. And a reporter assay was used to figure that out by Nirnberg and Mate. They started with a known RNA sequence, just a string of U's, threw it into this mess they didn't understand, and looked at what came out. It was a string of phenylalanines. And through that, you were able to decode that UUU must mean phenylalanine. Okay? So in that same way, this is something I found online, you can try to understand what is the logic through which the information is going from one generation to the next by using a reporter and following what happens to its regulation across uh, generations. I thought this was a great one. Its, its title is Escher Falling Down His Stairs. So uh, anyway, so I will introduce you now to a particular gene sequence that we found uh, really useful for studying changes across generations. We're simply calling it T. It makes two fluorescent proteins, M-cherry and GFP, as part of an operon. And uh, we can ask when this is on in the germline and off in the somatic cells, which is what happens normally from this promoter, how is that particular pattern per perpetuated generation after generation? So here's a simplified diagram of everything uh, that is C. elegans. And in fact, I would argue that anybody who shows you a diagram of any organism that doesn't go from one generation to the next isn't telling you the whole story. It's because organisms are this continuum from one generation to the next. So you have generation one where you make somatic cells, germ cells where this is expressed, and then that goes on to make sperm and egg which fuse to give you the next generation. So what must happen here? There must be some sort of arrangement here that is maybe nearly recreated in the next generation. There must be something asymmetric, something that happens in somatic cells that doesn't happen in germ cells. And then, crucially, you need to switch back to symmetry from asymmetry. This is something that's fundamentally ununderstood in biology for any problem that you uh, might think about. How do you go from asymmetry to symmetry? And that could be enforced through interactions between somatic and uh, germ cell lineages. Okay? So why is this a particularly useful gene? Well, we found out quite serendipitously that if you had this gene in males and mated it with wild-type animals that did not have the gene, now all of a sudden different siblings started showing different levels of expression. It ranged from really bright to really not detectable. Okay? And not only that, once you had that range, if you followed it in a pedigree across, you started seeing the gene being completely off. Okay? And that off state got transmitted to more than 250 generations. So that's a very large number. Even though the generation time is just three days, that represents years. Okay? So in, in human terms, if you were to say a generation time of only 25 years, it is as though you started this experiment before you invented the wheel and looked at the results now. Okay? Very difficult to do anything like this in other systems. Right, so now that that silencing happens, we can go in and ask molecularly what is going on. So I'll show you some preliminary results now where we looked at pre-mRNA levels. Remember, this is an operon, so we want to know what is the pre-mRNA change we didn't see that dramatic a change, but the assay was quite noisy. But if you look at the mRNA level, there was a dramatic dif difference between a gene that is active, like TA, which is on, and versus inactive when it is off. Okay, so TA is active on, inactive off. So this dramatic difference then says there is an RNA turnover or RNA that's disappearing. That's the reason why you're seeing this silencing. And not only that, you can also look at single molecules of RNA using single molecule fluorescence in situ hybridization. 
the basic idea is you make a lot of tiny probes that will um, be complementary to this transcript and glow in particular colors. And you can then ask, uh, bathe the animals in these probes and ask, where is it? So I'll show you a region that was imaged in this syncytial germline where you can look for mRNAs. And this is what that looks like. You see these dots in the top two panels that are missing from the bottom two? Those are single mo uh, molecule RNA fish signals. And if you overlap them after false coloring, you see that the green and the red do not overlap, as you'd expect for mRNAs that are separated after the operon leaves, uh, is transcribed into uh, RNA that leaves the nucleus. Okay? So once again, then we can turn to all the work that has happened in, uh, in C. elegans to define what is the pathway through which this RNA silencing is happening. We now know of additional small RNAs called pi RNAs, which are also conserved across evolution. They are typically found in the germline. And they, they are the short interfering RNAs, the same as the ones produced from long double-stranded RNA that comes in. Either of them can bind a primary argonaut and then engage in this RNA amplification mechanism at the periphery of a, of a nucleus, leading to downstream argonauts that cause silencing. So we did the same thing here, look at initiation separate from maintenance, and we first saw that this silencing that happens when you simply made it into a wild type requires this PRG1 primary argonaut, but not the RD1 primary argonaut. And if you look at maintenance, it looks like this downstream argonaut is also required at the later step. And then when we look at maintenance separately, we see that both these mutator foci and the downstream HRD1 argonaut are required. Okay, so initiation happens using that argonaut, and then maintenance happens using these downstream factors. So not only that, we can do some really cool experiments in C. elegans that are simply not possible in other systems. And I should say that this is because there are about a thousand C. elegans labs throughout the world uh, currently working who have developed such cool tools uh, that it's really exciting to be able to do this work. So what I'm going to uh, describe to you is an experiment where you bring the maternal and paternal nuclei together, and then you pull them apart without mixing the DNA. Okay? So then you get a mosaic animal in which the germline is all paternal and the rest of the body is maternal. So we can then ask if there is this RNA-based silencing, do the two P, maternal and paternal DNA even need to meet and need to mix? So the answer is they don't. Here's the experiment, and we do that by overexpressing a protein called GPR1, which pulls these two pronuclei apart so that you get a mosaic animal. And in this animal, the germline cells all have this transgene, and the somatic cells don't have it. And yet, when you make this cross with either wild type or with these GPR1 overexpressors, you get silencing. So that's consistent with RNA moving and causing silencing. So putting all this together at the molecular level, we have this model where small RNAs are bound by this argonaut, which is inherited to the next generation, can move in that one cell to cause silencing of the other nucleus, which is then maintained through many different, uh, many different divisions and uh, worm generations through these argonaut proteins and mutative foci. Okay? So that's the molecular model that we have. Often, when I've talked about this before, you get the question, well, is this one exception that happens, or is this the rule? It's uh, convenient to think about rules and exceptions, especially given our Bioscience Day title today. But biology is really telling us something even with every single exception, because it's telling you what is possible. Okay? It doesn't care what the rules are. We care what the rules are. Okay? So it's useful to think about what is common, what's not common. So if we look at all the many genes that people have tried in different labs, some patterns emerge. When you add double-stranded RNA against all these genes, you see some genes you get silencing for only a few generations, and some others you get silencing for many generations.
So what's going on? It could be really different in different labs, or there could be something fundamental that's happening which we haven't yet discovered. So to look at this systematically, we took the same sequence, green fluorescence protein, and put it under different contexts, fed the animals double-stranded RNA for just a short 24-hour period, and then looked what happens across generations. So here is green fluorescent protein under many different genic contexts. You don't need to worry about all those genes. And then the same exposure was done to them, and you look at how many generations showed you silencing. And you find that only the really susceptible gene that I showed already showed a lot of silencing. The others didn't. In most cases, the gene silencing recovered. Okay? This is even after, in that first generation, the RNA entered the germline and silenced the gene within the germline. So that means genes are able to bounce back even after changes with, within the germline. So getting back to what I was saying about the cell code being passed from one generation to the next, what gene silencing represents is a change to these regulatory interactions with that gene sequence. And what the results I just showed you say is that in most cases, you're bouncing back to what you were before, even though you were able to change something within the germline. Okay? So this forces us to think of the concept of epigenetic repair, if you will. Something that's not DNA, but regulatory change, which can be repaired. So I'll illustrate that in this way. If you take the same sequence and you have it as part of two gene sequences associated with their regulatory factors, you do RNA silencing. That presumably brings in all these argonaut proteins and so on to cause silencing. In most cases, you're bouncing back to the initial state through epigenetic repair. But in this, some cases, like the exception that I showed you, you have failure to repair, and then the silencing persists for many generations. Okay? So now we can define a proper question to pursue in the future, which is what determines the success versus failure of epigenetic repair. Okay? And that will be the thing that we work on in, uh, in our lab for many years to come. So as I wind up and close, I want to draw some general principles from the things that I've told you. Are the things that I've told you only about that sequence? No. So if we go back to this idea of the cell code going from one generation to the next, we've learned that it can't just be the genome sequence. There's other regulatory information that's going across. So how do we think about the information that's going from here to there? Well, if you think about just the genome sequence, you can change the information using mutation. And that mutation only goes to the next generation if it overcame DNA repair. You have repair machinery in your cells that will fix the mutation. And then that gets copied through replication in subsequent generations. Okay? So that's how sequence changes are transmitted. And now we have many different channels through which you could send information. How is that working? I'll give you a couple of concrete examples and then generalize. If you think about small RNAs that are transmitted, maybe all you need, like a mutation, is change the abundance of those small RNAs. And what you're overcoming is perhaps the turnover of those small RNAs, which engages an amplification machinery that just keeps amplifying generation after generation. Another class that is well known are protein folding mutants, like prions, which are disease-causing as well as endogenous process uh, engaging proteins that are folded states which can be transmitted across generations. Maybe there are chaperones that can fix that. You have to overcome that. And then you can have structural templating giving you more and more of the same. Okay? So in general, then, you can think of all these changes that are above or beyond the mutation of DNA sequence as epimutations. And these processes like DNA repair that try to reset back as epigenetic repair and finally, replication and all these other ways of maintaining the change as maintenance mechanisms. Remember that all of these are part of the cycling store, so it won't be just one particular thing. So the overall lesson then is hereditary changes need to escape repair and engage maintenance. We don't have to be limited by thinking about just changes in DNA sequence. And the reason so far we have been blind to other changes is because those changes got repaired better, not because they didn't happen. 
So um, in closing, I began with this caricature from the 1830s. It's easy for us to look back and say, no way we would have thought like that. But I hope I have shown you some new ways of thinking about how heredity works and an appreciation that only changes that overcome or escape this generation to generation homeostatic mechanism called transgenerational homeostasis will be uh, transmitted. DNA mutation that overcomes repair is just one such example. How is it passed on? Well, the replicating information we all know and appreciate easily. I hope you can also see that there's a second way of passing on information, which is through cycling stores of information that go from one bottleneck stage to the next bottleneck stage. So even now, when we think about heredity, there are lots of controversial uh, aspects to it and unclear aspects to it. And cartoonists uh, sharpen our view on this still. So this is a cartoon I grew up with, Calvin and Hopes, and here's Calvin uh, giving his best complaint to his parents. What assurance do I have that your parenting isn't screwing me up, okay? So that's the uh, age-old question of nature versus nurture, but I hope I've given you uh, a view that if you must argue about nature versus nurture, it is useful to remember that our nature is not just our genomes, it's at least our cell code. Okay. The ideas that I presented to you were, came from many discussions uh, with many colleagues at the University of Maryland and beyond, and I'm really grateful to them. And the work that I presented was done in my lab, and the future work that we're doing, uh, the unpublished work that I presented, is really spearheaded by Sindhija and Prav, two really talented graduate students, and others are helping as well. And I'd like to thank um, this group of uh, worm labs that get together and make sure that we all stay honest, and um, NIH for funding, and you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. So the question that Dave is asking is uh, the persistence of RNA silencing really formulated how you're approaching this question. Was it just luck? And uh, the short answer is absolutely. It was completely <laughs> luck. So the, the longer answer is when we were trying to do RNA going from neurons to the germline, there were very few tools available for expressing things in the germline. And at that time, one of the things that we stumbled upon was this particular gene. And this is why, as Nate was saying earlier, if you stick with it, at some point you'll come out with more insight. And don't toss your exceptions. Yeah. Questions? Thank you again. And okay. Thank you.